But we've been kind of trudging. I felt like I've been trudging through mud. But what I want to do today is, is kind of bring a bit of a, a, a top, put a full stop. I want to try to put a full stop to this. But, but, but here's the thing. I, I feel like I've been trudging and teaching. And, and I, I, I would say, some may disagree with me. You probably would have had feedback. I don't think I'm a teacher per se. It's not my thing. The line upon line, precept, but I've done my best to teach. This morning, what I want to do is I want to preach a little bit, okay? Um, and, and I want to submit this to you this morning. I want you to open your spiritual ears and listen. Because what I'm going to preach this morning, uh, I, I also don't stand in the office and go, I am a prophet to the nations or anything, but I want to preach something that I believe is prophetic this morning, that the Lord uh, confirmed to me on Tuesday as we were driving up there, the Lord began to speak to me as we we're heading up to the conference some things. And when we got there, it was just confirmed throughout the conference. And then again this morning, somebody in this room who wouldn't even realize walked in, made a comment about my shirt and confirmed again through some things. They said, and I just go, God, I'm excited about this morning and what you want to say. At the end of this this message, I'm going to let you know I'm going to call for a response from people. I'm going to call you to respond to it. I'm going to call you to get up, come out the front, get in the aisle, whatever, and, and, and we'll see what, what happens from there. But Lord, I, I just commit this morning in your hands. Father, what a great morning so far, Lord. That worship was awesome, God, to be able to get out of ourselves and to get our heads in a good space. God, to stop focusing on all the other muck going on in life and just to focus on you, Lord. You are so good. Father, we thank you, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, that moment in human history that has changed everything for us. Father, thank you, Lord, for the promise. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We thank you for that. God, we thank you for the promise of your spirit that we are not orphans, God, and that you are here with us right now. So, Father, I pray this morning, Lord, God, just, uh, Father, help my thoughts flow good. Give me the words, but, Lord, even if my words are stuffed up on the way, that's also a Greek word. God, I pray that you would open uh, our ears, each person in this room. Let us hear what it is individually, what the Holy Spirit is saying to them. That each person here would hear the word of God for them this morning. Each person here would see what it is, Holy Spirit, that you individually want to show them this morning in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. 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 You may be seated. Don't have to be. You can stand if you want. But if you're like me, your feet get sore. It's one of the things at these conferences, you're standing for so long, and I, I can't stand still. I'm always sort of trying to get off my feet here, but anyway, it was good. So we've been on this long journey about renewing our minds. And one of the things I began to ask God last week, because we've been trudging away, and I said to God early last week, I started to think, God, this has been really, really good. Like, it's been great, and the feedback's been good, and Lord, you've been doing things. But for me personally, I'm, I started to ask God, why? Why is this? Because I've never, we've never had a series. We've been going for about nine years now. We've never had a series that's lasted for six months. Who's been here long enough to know that? We've never done a theme for six months. You know, you might do something for four weeks or whatever, but six months, I'm going, God, each week I'm getting this ready, going, God, I'm over this myself. Why am I, we're talking about the same thing, Romans 12. Do not be conformed to the pattern as well, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We've got it finally, you know? But every week it was, no, now this, now this, now this, now this. And I began to say to God, God, why? Why so long on this one topic? And I believe that as we began to drive up the coast on Tuesday, that the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. He began to give me a little bit of an understanding as to why have we as a congregation had to trudge our way through this? Why has it been so important that we've pretty much danced around one scripture for pretty much six months. And the answer is this. It's apart from the fact that Paul was moved upon by the Holy Spirit to pen in Romans, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Apart from simple obedience to the word of God, who believes it's right to be obedient to the word of God. Yep. Apart from just simply being instructed to by Paul, we don't want to pass on to the next generation a purely intellectual, powerless, passionless, Holy Spiritless, sanitized and compromised version of the Christian faith. Amen. Let me say that again. We do not want to pass on to the next generation a purely intellectual, a powerless, a passionless, a Holy Spiritless, a sanitized and compromised version of the Christian faith. We don't want to do that. Who, who, who wants to do that? Hands up if you want to do that. I want to pray for you. We don't want to do that, okay? I gave my life to Jesus when I was 19, and, and that meant everything to me, and it changed my life. 
<laughs> and it set my life on a trajectory and a course. And I wouldn't be here if it was not for the work of God 30 odd years ago on a roundabout in the middle of the Pacific Highway in Ballina with trucks and buses going around me and crying out to God and going, God, I've, I've got enough knowledge and feeling and sense that you are there. And if you are there, take my life and can you make something good of the mess that I've created? And he did that. And, and that meant something to me. And that message came to me and was passed on to me by a generation of people. I was not brought up in the church or around Christians. But there were Christian people that God plopped me in the midst of who had passion, who had the Holy Spirit, who had the Word of God, who believed, who had faith, who trusted, who convinced me and showed me through their life that God is worth everything. God is worth everything. He's not just an additive that I can tack on to my life. He is worth everything everything. He's worth pursuing. He's worth living for. He's worth dying for. He's worth chasing after. He's worth believing everything he says and laying hold of everything he offers you. That's the God that was passed on to me. And now we have a responsibility as a generation ourselves to make sure that we are passing that on to the next generation. And how many of you know this current generation are facing a lot of things that are watering that down? This current generation are being attacked and, and, and there's a lot of stuff going on that you and I didn't deal with. And it's not like it's coming one thing in this generation, one thing in that generation, one thing in that generation. These young guys are getting it all in one hit. They're getting it all thrown at them in one hit. And I'll say it again, we do not want to pass on to the next generation a purely intellectual, a powerless, passionless, Holy Spiritless, sanitized and compromised version of the Christian faith because they won't want it. They won't want it. People may be wanting a more user-friendly version of the gospel, but they actually need the true gospel, which includes the reality of the power and the presence of the Spirit in the lives of those who have submitted their life to Jesus. Go with me. I, I didn't give these guys any scriptures, so maybe you can keep up with me if you can. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 to 7. Let's start here. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 to 7. I'm going somewhere with this, so follow me. Romans 8, 5 to 7. Paul writes this, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. In other words, there's a correlation between what you're living and what you're chasing after and where your mind is. He says, those who live according to the flesh, why are they living according to the flesh? Well, their minds are set on what the flesh desires. That's why. So if your mind is set on the things of this world, you'll live for the things of this world. If your mind is set on what your flesh wants, then your flesh will get what it wants. Why? Because your mind's set on that stuff. It's paramount to you. It's important. He says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh is on. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. In other words, my mind's set on what the Spirit desires. You ever thought about this? The Holy Spirit that is present in this place now, that came into your life when you gave your life to Jesus, that Spirit has desires. That Holy Spirit has desires. And if you can set your mind on the Spirit's desires, he says, and you can walk in the Spirit. But if you don't want to set your mind on the Spirit's desires, you want to set your mind on the desires of the flesh, the desires of the world, bigger, faster, more, and so on. He said, if you set your mind on that, that is where your life is going to go because your life will follow your thinking. You'll go where your mind's taking you. That's why it's so important as Christians. Renew your mind. Do not be conformed. How do you be conformed? Don't do anything. Just sit there and marinate in whatever's coming your way and you will slowly but surely be conformed and you won't even realize it's happening. But he says be transformed. Transforming takes effort. It takes a bit of energy. It takes a bit of work on our part. Getting in the word of God. Looking at what God has to say, getting quietly before him, listening to the voice of the Spirit on the inside of us. Holy Spirit, what are you saying? Where are you taking me? What do you want me to do? It takes a little bit of discipline and work on our part. And verse 6, he says, the mind governed by the flesh is death. In other words, the mind that, 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 that the flesh is controlling, the mind that said things at the ultimate end of that is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. And verse 7, this is what I want you to see. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Think about that. The mind governed by the flesh, it's hostile to God. If your mind is set on the things of the flesh and the things of this world, if that's your number one desire, here's a reality for you this morning. That means your mind is hostile to God. Not because you're a bad person. He's not saying because you're bad people. He says it's hostile to God. And then, he's par and then he explains what he means by that. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. 
Let me put it in simple terms. The mind that is governed by the flesh will resist what the Spirit wants to do. The mind governed by the flesh will push back against whatever it is that the Holy Spirit wants to do. The Holy Spirit wants to do something in your life, but your mind is set on the things of the world and the things of the flesh. And when the Spirit comes knocking and wants you to respond or lay something down or pick something up or stop or start or go left, right, up or down, your mind will say no. And you will resist the very work of the Holy Spirit in your own life. Why? Because your mind is set on the things of the flesh. It's set on the things of this world. It's not set on the things of God. An unrenewed mind, which is a conformed mind, it will push back against what the Spirit is doing. Not because a person is bad, but because an unrenewed mind can't submit to the Spirit's work. It can't submit to the Spirit's work. We've all been in those situations. And maybe it's you or maybe it's somebody you know. The Holy Spirit begins to do something, a move or whatever. You know whether it be corporately, whether it be individually, and you just see that person, they start squirming and they're all uncomfortable and they don't. They don't like it. We just assume everyone that's born of God loves everything the Holy Spirit does. No, they don't. No, they don't. If you don't renew your mind, if you allow yourself to get conformed to the pattern of this world, and then somebody comes along and tries to tell you what the Word of God says about sexuality or gender or marriage or any number of cultural topics around there, someone comes along and says, well, here's what the Word... Oh. We resist it. We push back against it. We don't want it. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to participate in it. This is why we need to renew our minds because an unrenewed mind will not go where the Spirit leads. It will not respond when the Spirit calls and it will not discern what the Holy Spirit's doing. An unrenewed mind will not do those things. Otherwise, here's the thing. We're going to find ourselves passing on to the next generation a purely intellectual, powerless, Holy Spiritless, lifeless, passionless, sanitized and compromised version of the Christian faith if we don't renew our minds. Something that looks more like a nice philosophy to live by and less and less like the kind of New Testament Christianity that once turned the world upside down. And I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be the one passing that on. I look at that and go, that's not worth passing on. You know, we, 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 I want to pass on to my kids good things in the natural, right? I don't want to pass a debt on to my kids. You better be good. <laughs> you know? My, 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 desire is to, my desire is to leave my kids in a, in a place where, and imagine it's like this, it's like my, my parents started down here and, 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 and my parents took a step up and, and, and then they left me here, just that little bit higher, that little bit better in the natural. And so I want to take a step up and leave my kids that little bit up too. I don't want to be going backwards down here and having them to come back and start and redig wells and reclaim ground that I claimed my generations before me took a hold of, fought for, died for, but I'm going to hand it all back to the enemy and say, now you guys start from scratch again. I don't want to do that I don't want to do that and the church has come a long way and God's done some amazing things and we've got some ground and we've got some knowledge and some understanding and some revelation and so on I don't want to be part of a generation that sets the clock back and then says to these guys now you've got to rework out stuff that we worked out thousands of years ago we're going to rip it all away now and tell you to start from scratch I don't want to do that but it's going to happen if I don't renew my mind, especially in the culture in which I live. If I allow myself to be conformed to the pattern of this world, it's like taking them back. It's like taking them backwards in time. Exodus chapter 1, we've got this story. The king of Egypt, he tries to take out a whole generation because he thought he was weakening the nation because the Jews were becoming too numerous. You know the story, they're in Egypt and there's a new king. And he goes, man, these, these Jews are multiplying and growing and they're becoming that numerous that eventually they're going to be too many. They'll overpower us. We can't control them. And so what does he decide to do? He decides, tells the midwives, and he says, you know, all the young boys kill them. In other words, let's take out a whole generation. Let's do our bit to take out a whole generation. But the reality is that God was up to something. And the devil knew it. There was a deliverer coming and his name was Moses. Exactly right. Moses was on his way. God knew what he was doing. God knew something was coming. In the natural, what happened in the natural? In the natural, the king of Egypt said, oh, well, I've got this problem. Now, that wasn't the real problem. The real problem was a spiritual problem. The devil knew that God was up to something. There was a deliverer coming, and it doesn't matter what you try to do to put these people down, I'm going to set them free. And so in the background behind the natural, the natural says these people are becoming too numerous. 
I'm in control, let's kill this generation so they don't overpower us and we can have slaves for the rest of our days. That's what's going on in the natural. What's going on behind the scenes? God's got a plan. He's going to raise up a young man called Moses. The devil knows that there's something going on. So he places in the heart of Pharaoh, of, of, of the king of Egypt, and he says, hey, what I want you to do, take a whole generation out. That'll kind of thwart this plan of God. But guess what? It didn't work, and Moses was born, and he came and he set God's people free. Matthew chapter 2, we've got a similar story, don't we? Herod. Herod hears about the star and the birth of a baby. And so Herod th- th- then, then tells the Magi, these wise men, he says, go and worship the, uh, this, this, this son of God, this, this king. And they come back and tell me where he is so I can go and I can worship him too. But they were smart. They knew. The Holy Spirit told them, don't go back there because he's, he's going to go and he wants to take him out. Because for, from Herod's perspective, this is another king who could eventually challenge my king. I'm going to take him out now. It was a challenge to his authority, challenge to his strength. So let's get rid of this supposed king of the Jews. That's what's happening in the natural. But behind the scenes, behind the scenes, God was up to something. Amen? God was up to something. And the devil knew it. The devil knew it. What's happening in the natural usually has a spiritual thing going on behind it. Right? There's a spiritual thing going on behind. God knows. God's up to something. He's about to bring not just the deliverer of God's people, the deliverer of all people into the world. God's up to something. The devil knows it. Let's take another generation out. Let's not take a chance. Let's take a whole generation out. Because Jesus was going to be born. Now I think about that and I think about today and here's the conclusion I come to. Today God is up to something. He's up to something and the devil knows it. And that's why he's leading an all-out assault on the next generation, on their families, on their gender, their sexuality, their attitude towards authority, etc., etc., and for the believing ones on their ability to freely and passionately follow after their Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. He is coming all out after this next generation. He's trying to take a whole generation out. Why? Because he knows something. God is up to something. God is up to something. This next generation that are coming through, I think they are going to go far further than any of us have gone. They're going to lift things way heavier than we've ever lifted. They're going to do things beyond our wildest imaginations. And if we can hang around long enough, we are going to see things that we've never seen in the past because I think what's up ahead is way better than the best that we've experienced back there. And this generation are called of God to bring that in. They're called of God to, 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 to usher that in. Whatever it is that God is doing, it's going to be awesome. And God's up to something, but the devil knows it. So he's trying again to take out an entire generation of people. He's trying to take out an entire generation. Much like when the church started, this generation is being birthed into a time where the seeds of persecution are being replanted. We've had it so easy in Australia. We have had it so easy in this nation when it comes to our faith and how we express our faith. But guess what? Those seeds of persecution are starting to get planted in our nation. They are. They're starting to get planted. And this younger generation are going to be growing up in a world now facing kinds and types of persecution as Christians in this country that we never faced. We used to be liked. When, we, when a lot of people in this room grew up in your faith, you were popular. People liked you because you, you were a nice person. We were nice. The Christians are nice. Because I don't want to feed that hungry person, but the Christians will do it. I don't want to clothe that naked, but the Christians, they clothe them. They clothe them. Christians were nice. But how many of you know that's changing? That's changing. Because we're getting kind of to the limits of some of our niceness. And we're going, hey, we, we, we could play with you over here. We can't play with you over there. I'm sorry, but w- w- we still have another Lord, another God, another King. We, we're still subservient to another authority above yours. And we've we kind of got to, we, we, I'm sorry, I can't go there with you. But unfortunately, some of us are going, well, we will. We'll go over there with you and we'll stand with you and we'll put our arms around you and go, see, we're the real Christians and those guys, they're just... And so this church becomes popular. That church over there becomes less and less and less popular. That kind of mentality, that kind of attitude, if you're going to actually believe God, if you're going to take a stand, it's less and less popular these days. So this generation are being birthed into a time where the seeds of persecution are being replanted. Now that... Sounds on the surface like a bad thing, but the reality is that's actually a really exciting thing. 
Because you want to know what happens when you get seeds of persecution planted in a generation coming up in faith? Go to Afghanistan and have a look what happens. Go to Iraq right now and see what happens. Fastest growing church in the world is in Iraq. Go to India right now and see what happens when you get uh, uh, Christians, a generation being raised up in the midst of a place of persecution. Go to India and have a look. Go to China and have a look. Something exciting happens in the midst of that. So that makes me excited. I see the, the, the seeds of persecution being sown in our nation. It, it's getting harder and harder to be a Christian. But at the same time, I see a generation of young Christians being raised up, believers being raised up in that environment. I think, God, what would make us any different than China, India, Afghanistan, Iraq? If in persecuted places, the church just seems to thrive and grow and blossom, God, then why would that be any different being here? Why would it be any different being here? See, this emerging generation have been labelled the most confused generation. They've been labelled the most medicated, the most anxious and the most depressed generation ever. But God's calling them. And they're going to be the ones who will stand up and say, we don't fear those who can kill the body or cancel us on social media or fire us from our jobs or kick us out of the team or remove us from the in crowd or persecute us in public or ridicule us in private. We fear the one who holds eternal destiny in his hands, who carries governments on his shoulders, has the power to lift up and put down, who speaks good news to the poor, liberty to those in captivity, who brings recovery of sight to the blind, opens prison doors, breaks limitations of chains, the one who gives beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, the one who rolls stones away, removes grave clothes, who goes by the name of healer, deliverer, king of kings, lord of lord, and my personal saviour, that's the one that they're going to choose to fear. That's the one they're going to stand up and draw a line in the sand at some point and go, hey, this is our God. This is who we stand for. This is who we gave our life to. And in the moment of compromise, at some point, it's going to snap. It's got to stop. It's got to stop with someone. And I am full of faith that this younger generation are going to be the ones that will cut the cord and go, no more. They'll have a boldness we didn't have, a faith we didn't have, a confidence we didn't have, a resilience in their faith that many of us today struggle to have. But here's the challenge. Here's what I want to leave you. Here's the big thought I want you to think about. Everyone in this room, here's what I want you to think about. Will we play our part in helping them walk into everything God has for them? Will we play our role right now? Because every generation has a role to play when it comes to passing it on to the next. Will we play our role? Go with me to the book of Judges, just very quickly if you've got a, a, a Bible there. Judges chapter 6, verse 13. I just want to read two verses out of Judges and we're going to wrap it up. Judges chapter 6 and verse 13. Watch this. The Lord comes, an angel of the Lord comes to Gideon. Gideon is in a, a, a wine press threshing wheat. In other words, in simple language, he's in a hole in the ground. And he's hitting the pitchfork into the wheat. And what they do is they pick it and throw it up and the wind would blow the chaff away and the good wheat would fall to the ground. But you do that out in the open where the wind is. You pick it up, you throw it at the wind. But he's in a wine press in a hole in the ground. Why? Because he's afraid. He's afraid. The Midianites are coming in and other nations are coming in. And so Israel are in fear, in secrecy, threshing wheat in a hole in the ground. And an angel comes to Gideon. And the angel says, you mighty man of valor, you warrior, we all know the story. Gideon's like, are you talking to me? I'm in a wine press, dude. I'm in a hole in the ground hiding in fear and you're calling me a mighty man of valor. See, God, God sees things different to us. God sees things different than we see them. Part of the Christian journey is to come into alignment with what God says and what God sees, not just what I think and what I say. It's coming into alignment with God. And this angel says, Gideon says to the angel, pardon me, my Lord. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about? When they said, not, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and given us to the hand of Midian. Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about? The New King James says this, where are all his miracles? The word in the, in the, in the Hebrew literally means to, to be beyond one's power. Where are the things that are beyond the power of man? Where are the things that were difficult to do, that were surpassing, that were extraordinary? Where are the miracles? He's saying to the angel, where are all the miracles that our forefathers, that the previous generation told us about? Now, here's the thing. If all we have to pass on to the next generation are stories, everyone say stories. 
If all we have to pass on to the next generation are nothing more than stories of who God was and what he did, then we need to examine where we are now and ask ourselves some tough questions. If all we have are stories, Gideon said, where are, the, where are the miracles that they told us about? In other words, we never saw them. When we were growing up, we didn't see them. When we were growing up, we didn't see God do mighty, wonderful things. We didn't see the miracles. We didn't see the power of God. When we were brought up, we didn't see the activity of the Holy Spirit. When we were brought up, we didn't see, but they told us about it. They told us about it. And I believe that each generation is called to do more than just tell the next generation about the good things that God can do and about who God was. We need to show them who God is and what he is doing now. That's the call of one generation to the next, not to just give stories, but show them. Show them. Show them what God is doing. Talk to them of the power of God. Show them. Pray with them. Let them be a part of the the, the journey. Let them know about the healings. Let them know about the deliverance. Let them know about the miracles. We've got to show them something. Gideon finds himself, his whole generation being raided and so on. And I go, part of the problem here is because they were not brought up seeing and knowing. They were just being told. And if all you've got is stories... It doesn't, it's not going to give you enough. It's not going to give you enough to stand. Because each generation seems to have a bigger and bigger enemy, a stronger and stronger enemy, a smarter and smarter enemy coming against them. And if all we have to pass on to the next generation is stories, then we need to examine where we are now and ask ourselves some questions. Go back three verses, three verses in Judges chapter 6. Just before the angel comes to Gideon, there's an interesting couple of passages. Judges chapter 6, verse 8 to 10. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. This is a previous generation. And I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and I gave you their land. Verse 10. I said to you, I. Everyone say I. I am the Lord, your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. Isn't that frightening? I delivered you. I came to you one day and I saved you. And I pulled you out of the miry clay. And I washed you clean. And I forgave you. And I took away the guilt. And I took away the shame. And I took away the reproach. And I gave you a new destiny and a new future and a new name. And all I asked you to do was obey me. Don't worship the gods of the culture that you're in. Do not get caught up in that stuff. For I'm the Lord your God. But he says to them, but you didn't do it. You didn't listen to me. You didn't obey me. In other words, you compromised. You compromised. You compromised with the land you were in. You compromised with the culture. See, Gideon had not seen the power of God in his generation because the previous generation had compromised with culture and disobeyed God. Compromise is the doorway to powerless, passionless, lifeless, religious Christianity. We're not called to pass on to the next generation stories of who God was and what he did. We are called to show the next generation who God is and what he's doing. We've got to show them who he is and what he's doing. I don't want, I don't want the next generation of young kids in a rise. One day we're going to fall off the perch and disappear and there's all these young kids here. I'm hoping that, that you guys are going to be running the show and pastoring and preaching and leading worship and all that's, that's going to happen, I hope, if not here, somewhere else. But I don't want God to come to you one day and you to go to him. Hey, where are all the miracles that those guys talked about? I want them to go, you know what? Those guys showed us a God of power. Those guys showed us a God that is alive. Those guys showed us a God that is real. Those guys showed us a God that heals the sick. Those guys showed us a God that raises the... Those guys showed us a God that, that casts out demons. Those guys showed us a God that provides uh, in, in, in impossible situations. Those guys showed us a God that can do exceedingly abundantly above all I could possibly ask or think. That's what they showed me. So bring it on. 
You're saying I'm a mighty man. I believe you, angel. I believe you. I'm a mighty man of value. You're right. You're probably understating it, actually. I want that. I want that for this next generation. And that's the thing, that's the role that we need to play, and that's the question we need to ask ourselves. Are we compromising? Are we compromising? Are there areas of our life where we know it? And, and let me tell you something. I know that some of us are. The last, I've, had, I've had the, the deepest and richest conversations with people in this church in the last five months around some of these issues we've talked about. And, 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 and I have so appreciated the honesty and, and the stuff that's coming out of people's hearts and what the Lord is saying to them, the challenges. I've had people come up and say, you know what, until today I believed that was okay. Now I know it's not. Not because you said it, but because I saw it in the Word of God. Because the Holy Spirit confirmed it to me. That's right. And I've had these kinds of conversations week after week after week. So I know that God has been speaking. I know God's been showing us areas where we've been compromising, where we've come into culture and we're playing and flirting a little bit with culture. Nothing. I mean, I, I, I love the world I live in. Don't, please don't think I'm some living on a hill monk by myself with no TV. It's not like that. But I know there's a line between what I can and what I can't. I know there's a line between what's, what's, you know, what's good for me and what's not. I know there's a place where the Holy Spirit's blessing and power is dancing around and saying, hey, play here, man, I've got so much for you. I also know there's a place where I might walk there and the Spirit goes, hey, I, I... he's with me, but I can't bless this and I won't bless this. Sorry, I love you. It's got nothing to do with your value to me or my love for you, but, but I can't, I can't rubber stamp this I'll get the band to come back up see we're not called to pass on to the next generation stories of who God was and what he did and we're called to show the next generation who God is and what he's doing and we'll not do that we will not do that as long as we continue to shrink back from the truth we will not do that as long as we fear man instead of God and we'll not do that as long as we make excuses for our compromise and we settle for a faith that looks nice and sanitized, but is that totally devoid of the Holy Spirit's power? I, to I told you at the start I wanted to finish with a little bit of a call, a little bit of a response this morning. This is not a new response. You'll see it all throughout the Old Testament. I think you'll probably see Paul throws it out a few times as well in the New but I'll use the most popular one. It's in the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 24, verse 14 to 15. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Throw them away. That stuff in your past, that stuff, the stuff I pulled you out of, the stuff I dragged you out of, the stuff I set you for, throw it away. Throw it away. Make a decision that I'm going to throw it away. I'm not taking it into my future another minute. It stays where it belongs. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. When you go to work, serve the Lord. When you go to school, serve the Lord. When you go home after church, serve the Lord. When you're raising your kids, serve the Lord. When you're playing sport, serve the Lord. There's a huge call on this next generation and we are laying a foundation for them as we speak. They're watching us. We're showing them God can be trusted. You want to know if you can trust God? Look at my life. That's, that's, that should be our testimony. You want to know if compromise is okay? Look at my life. You want to know if God is faithful? Look at my life. 
this is the testimony this is what we need to be passing on to them they have so much they're dealing with and so much coming against them the one stable firm thing in their world should be the reality and the presence and the power of the God that we are showing them They might be confused about everything out there. But when they come in here, we know who God is. We know our identity. We know who we are. We know who we stand for. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Verse 15. And I love this. Because it's a choice. Everyone say choice. Life is about choices. Some of us are waiting. Some of us are waiting for a a Holy Spirit to drop magic dust on us before we become real followers of Jesus. Some of us are waiting for a goosebumpy feeling from heaven and writing on a wall before we make the decision to go, I'm going to start following you, Jesus. Before we make the decision to go, I'm going to start obeying you, Jesus. Before we stand up. And as somebody said this morning, Sue, where's Sue? Where are you? Where are you? Sue, that was one of the most beautiful, powerful communion messages I've heard. Some of us are waiting for a sprinkle of magic, superpower, Holy Spirit dust before we have the courage to say, I follow Jesus. I go to church on Sunday morning. Sorry, can't come. Before we say to somebody, hey, can I pray for you? I was in a similar situation yesterday myself to what you were talking about. I was up at the hospital with a a lady who was palliative. And to my knowledge, not a believer. And I was there with another man who doesn't share my faith. And I'm there going, well, God, I really want to pray. Like I've been asked to come up here and and be with these people. I I, want to pray. I know that in, in the natural there's no comprehension here but God I I believe that if I ask you to break through that I believe that I could preach the gospel here I believe I could pray I believe that you could do things and I'm waiting for the sprinkle of magic dust for this roar of the lion can I pray right you know and you know it didn't happen in the end I just had to go would you be okay because you know my faith and my worldview would you be okay if I pray and amazingly, they said yes. It's like, oh, okay. Wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Some of us are waiting for that. We're wanting a goosebump or a feeling before we make the choice to go, I'm, not, I'm just not going to compromise anymore. It's, it's too important. What we have to pass on to the next generation is too important to give them a watered down, passionless, lifeless, Holy Spiritless version of Christianity that's nothing more than a great philosophy that you can either choose or not choose. It's up to you. This is life and death. One day, if you're in this room right now, one day you are going to pass from death to life. Just like that beautiful woman did. I got a call at 8.30 this morning. She passed away. One day that's going to be me and that's going to be you. I can tell you now, when I pass from here to there, I'm very confident. I'm very confident the Lord's going to look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. I'm very confident I'm going to spend eternity in a place that my human finite brain cannot fathom. It's going to be more wonderful than the world wonderful. More amazing than anything I could picture or imagine. I I, I have confidence I'm going to be there. I know a lot of people don't have that confidence. I know a lot of people are sitting and go, yeah, I kind of believe this Jesus stuff, but I don't want to dive in too much. I don't want to be too. Maybe you're here today and you don't have faith. Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus. Stop waiting for a feeling. Stop waiting for a goosebump. If you have any inkling inside of you that you think this could be true, dive in. What have you got to lose? Trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. In verse 15, he says, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day who you're going to serve. Whether the gods, of your, an- the gods your ancestors served beyond the river 
or the gods of the Amorites or whose land you are living in. You can choose to serve the God of culture, the God of popular opinion. You can choose to serve the God of comfortableness, the God of ease, the God of security. You can choose to serve any God you want. This is what Joshua is saying. You guys, if serving God seems undesirable to you, if there's something in you that says, I don't want that, you are free to leave. This is what he's saying. You are free to go. Nobody's forced in here. Then he makes this declaration. He says, but as for me and my household... We will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. I'm going to ask you to do something this morning. If you feel like the Holy Spirit's challenging you, if you feel like God's speaking to you, and you want to say, you know what, if you, maybe, you, maybe you see, maybe you know, hey, you, I don't care how insignificant you feel you are in the life of this spiritual community. If you are a part of this community, you are passing something on to the younger generation. You are passing something on to them. You are passing something on to them, just like all of us are. It's not just about my natural children. It's, it, it, it's not just about the kids that live in my house. It's those that know I follow Jesus and are looking and I'm modeling and I'm showing something to them. So if that's you here today and, and you want to draw a bit of a line in the sand in your own world and go, you know what? I, I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to leave them with stories of who God was and what God did. I'm going to be the kind of person that positions myself, trusts God, grows in faith, grows in passion, walks with the Holy Spirit so these kids don't hear me telling them what he did and who he was. They can see in my life what he's doing and who he is right now. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to do something. I just want you to stand up. I want you to step out into the aisle. I want you to come up to the front, whatever. I'm not going to run around and pray for people, but I want you to get up, step out, make yourself known to everybody else in the room. This is my decision today. This is what I'm going to do. If that's you, I'm just going to ask you once. I want to carry on about it. Because if the Holy Spirit's not stirring you up right now, so be it. But if that's you, I'm going to ask you right now, just stand up, just step forward, step out into the aisle. Just move out into a, into, into a space, a place, so everybody else can see you. Not, not to highlight you, not to make you more special or better than anybody. But it's our way. It's our way of, 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 of doing something physically and making a spiritual statement. God, we don't want to compromise anymore. God, I don't want to compromise anymore, Lord. God, I don't want to settle for second best or third best or fourth best when I know that you have a best out there for me, God. Father, I don't want to play church when it feels good. I don't want to rely on fairy dust from heaven and goosebumps. I want to make a choice every minute, every day, moving forward, every step. God, I'm not going to compromise and live for the gods of this world. I'm not going to live for the gods of culture and convenience. It might not be easy. It might be tough. It might be hard. It might not be fashionable. It might not be sexy. It might not be popular. But God, I don't care anymore. At some point in my life, I've got to make this decision. Choose this day who you will serve. Okay, now here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. All of you standing, I want you to look around. I want you to grab someone, groups of two or three, and I want you to lay hands on each other, ask, is it okay? I want you to pray for each other this morning. I want you to just get in groups of two and three, just go, jump in groups of two or three right now. Grab someone you wouldn't normally pray with or be with, whatever. And let's pray for one another this morning. Let's pray that what God has spoken, what the Lord's doing, what He's saying to you, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's seal some things this morning. You're going to walk out of here and the birds of the air and the worries and cares of life are going to try to take them away. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, seal in our hearts Your Word this morning. Seal in our hearts what it is that You're saying to us, God, this morning. Bless you, Lord. We just lift our hands to God. Just open your just open your hands to the Lord this morning while these guys are praying. Let's just let's just pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, God, in your church, Lord. God, we thank you for what you're doing in your bride, Lord, that you are coming back for a spotless, clean bride, Father. Lord, we thank you, God, that you have plans and purposes. Thank you, Lord, that there are seasons and times, God, that 
this world's not just going to keep running till the battery dies out. Thank you, Lord. You're not sitting out there in the cosmos somewhere just watching us, but you're here with us, God. And now, Father, I pray for each person in this room. Lord, I pray. God, Paul, in Ephesians, tells us to be continuously filled with the Spirit. That's not just a one-off thing. It doesn't just happen once. He paints this picture of we should continuously be coming back to the fountain of God and drinking and taking in and taking in. And so, Father, we do that right now, Lord. I pray for each person in this room. Lord, would you just fill us again, fill us in a fresh way, God. Fill us in a new way this morning with your Spirit, God. Father, fill us, God, with your Holy Spirit. Lord, empower us, God, to live a life of no compromise. Empower us to live a life of witness for you, God. Empower us to preach the gospel to those that don't know it. Empower us to love those that others don't. Empower us, God, to meet the needs of those that others can't. Father, open our eyes to see in our community, in our families, in our workplaces, to see what you are doing, God. I pray as we leave this place, that God, we wouldn't go back out that door thinking that there's just a a world out there running around. But God, we would know that, Father, you orchestrate things. God, you you open doors, you close doors, you you, you magnify, you simplify. God, you you are working, you are active, you are uh, uh, moving in our community. And Father, I pray that each of us as we leave this place this morning, we would have eyes to see what the Spirit's doing, ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. And that God, you would use us, Father, we pray, use us, God. Use us, God. Use us, Lord, to bring healing and deliverance and miracles. God, use us, I pray. Father, we do not want to be a generation that passes on nothing but stories because we don't want to believe you, because we don't want to put ourselves in uncomfortable places, because we don't want to exercise faith. So we'll just, well, let's just talk about what was and what has been. Father, I pray every person in this room, God, you would stir us up to not settle for secondhand testimonies. God, for secondhand miracles. God, we would move out of this place today and we would, be going, we would have a heart that says, God, we want, I want a testimony today of your goodness and your activity and I want another one tomorrow and another one tomorrow. I want to see what you're doing and hear what you're saying, Lord, because I want to pass that on to the next generation. God, not that you used to do things that once upon a time God did, once upon a time God said, but now God is. Now God says, this is who God is, alive and active right now, 2024, here in Ganilaba, in our lives, God, I pray. I pray for everyone in this room, Lord. Don't let us walk away from here this morning and go, that was a great bunch of hype. That was just great feelings. And God, I pray we would know that, God, you are doing something in our midst, Father. In Jesus' precious, precious name. Everybody said, Amen.